Hey, what's up? It's Jared with Ditch Auto, and today I've got 10 things that I think you need to know about the Nikon Z6. Now, I've been spending a lot of time with this camera. I've talked about it in a previous video uh, with my first shots, and I just absolutely love this camera. I think it's a fantastic kind of first generation camera from Nikon. You know, they're, they definitely took their time getting into the mirrorless game here with uh, Sony having just a huge head start. Nikon really did a good job jumping in here and getting started with their mirrorless platform. And that's why I wanted to talk about it because it's just been such a great camera considering the fact that all of my stuff is Sony. I've been shooting on Sony for the last five years. Prior to that, I shot Canon for about 10 years. And you know, the Nikon Z6 really just made an excellent impression on me. Over the last couple of months, we took it traveling for two straight months. It's kind of my grab and go camera when I just need to take a couple of quick shots. Um, and so I've got 10 things that I wanted to talk about today that I think are interesting and useful tidbits of information for you to know about this camera. So the first thing is the ergonomics of the camera and just the design and layout of the camera is absolutely great. Now, one of the things that Nikon users, and I've never been like a, a Nikon user, I've used Nikon cameras, but one of the things that Nikon users will always argue is that the camera ergonomics and the layout is just absolutely great. A Nikon user is someone that you just really can't shake and get excited about little bells and whistles that come out on new cameras because their Nikon layout and ergonomics is just so great. And nothing has changed here with the Z6. Not only is the camera just a joy to hold and it feels great in the hand, but the button layout is well thought out and absolutely fantastic. They've placed buttons not so close together that you have to look and see what button goes where, but actually place buttons strategically throughout the camera so that you can really use the camera without having to look at the buttons. I mean, there's function buttons right down in here, uh, right around the lens, and you can easily get to those function buttons and customize those to do different things on the camera, as opposed to stacking them all in a little row together here or making some other button multi-function depending on what mode that you're in. So I absolutely love that about the camera. You know, I, I have an average to larger hand size and so the camera just feels really good. I feel like I have a lot to hold on to here and that the camera is not going to, you know, fall out of my hand. I also don't get tired holding this camera. Sometimes like gripping a camera can be a lot. If the camera body's too small, you're kind of cramped up trying to hold on to the camera and if it's too big, it just feels like, you know, you you just can't get your hands around it. And this camera is just a great mixture of all of those things, not being too large, not being too small and giving you all the buttons and options that you need to make sure that you have just a great overall experience. So the second thing is the fantastic screen and EVF. Now, this is not a DSLR style camera because it doesn't have a mirror on the inside. It is mirrorless. And so you can't just look through the viewfinder here and see out the camera. You have to have it powered on because this is an electronic viewfinder. Now, an electronic viewfinder means there's a little tiny screen in here that you're looking at. And what I like about this is when you're taking photos, you don't have to pull your camera down and look on the back screen. You can see your image playback right in the back of the EVF and the EVF on this camera is actually really nice and it gives you a really nice playback of your image uh, also the screen on the back is really nice actually I feel like it's not necessarily nicer as far as the technology goes than other cameras but I've noticed that just the rendering back of your image and the display that it gives you is very nice and vibrant it's easy to see when you're outside on a bright day and I just feel like I have a great experience looking at the back of the screen when I'm reviewing images, when I'm holding the camera up and maybe using live view on the back of the display as opposed to using the EVF instead. Um, the screen just is really nice. Now they went with the kind of uh, flippy style screen, flip out style screen like on a, a Sony. And so that means that the screen isn't gonna flip up over the top or out to the side for those of you that might want to use it as a vlogging camera or something like that or to take selfies. But nonetheless, I, I like the, the screen and the way that it is. I almost would prefer, I mean, I would prefer it to go up so that I can see it and maybe use it to vlog from time to time. But I prefer to have the screen pop up and go out like that as opposed to flopping out to the side. I, I just don't like having to look all the way out here 
I like being able to look straight line through the camera. That just feels better to me than having to look over here at a screen when my camera is pointing that way. It just doesn't feel right to me. So I like the screen itself. Maybe some little changes would have been nice with a little bit more articulation, but the screen is absolutely beautiful. And I find myself always being impressed with the display after having spent time with my Sony's or even a Canon EOS R. So I think they did a great job there with that. Uh, number three is the native lenses are available-ish. There are not a whole lot of native lenses yet for the Z-mount platform. With that said, I think that Nikon is taking a different approach to doing all of this. They put out a fantastic camera body that's solid, that does a great job with the Z6 and the Z7 and the rumored Z8 maybe or something like that coming soon. And their lenses are not there yet. Uh, they have some lenses that are available. This is the 24 to 70 f4, which surprisingly is an absolutely fantastic lens, and I've really enjoyed using it. Even though I wouldn't mind it being a 2.8 instead, um, maybe a little bit bigger of a lens, a little bit more to hold on to. But it's a fantastic lens. I have a bunch of primes on the way for the camera, so I'm excited to spend some time with some other lenses as well on this camera. And Nikon also has a roadmap that they put out of lenses that they're releasing, and not too far into the future, all of their lenses that you would expect to have on a camera platform like this will be available. Number four is the ability to adapt your existing Nikon glass to this camera and actually have a great experience uh, using the FTZ adapter. The FTZ adapter actually works really good and I saw this firsthand when I was at NAB, which is a trade show and expo for uh, video production in Las Vegas. It's kind of like CES, but for video production. And Nikon had a booth there. They had a whole bunch of Z6s and Z7s and I picked up a Z7 that had the adapter and an 85 millimeter prime from Nikon on it and it just kind of blew me away like I've used adapted glass on Sony and Canon and it just wasn't as great of an experience now I can't say that for EOS R but prior versions of adapting Canon glass to prior mirrorless cameras that they have. So with the FTZ adapter adapted, I was just really blown away at how well autofocus held up and the image that was being captured and all of that stuff. I just thought, okay, this is something special here. Nikon doesn't necessarily have to be in as hurry uh, to get all of their native glass created because their existing glass works absolutely fantastic adapted to their new mirrorless line. Now that can be kind of a problem for those of us that are not existing Nikon shooters who don't have a bunch of Nikon glass to adapt to their new platform. That means that we either have to decide to buy some existing Nikon glass or wait for a while. Even though there is that roadmap that, you know, there's lenses coming and all that stuff, they aren't necessarily coming fast enough for somebody who's a pro shooter who wants access to that type of glass now. Um, but the adaptability is definitely something that you can take advantage of. You could pick up some used glass, even though Nikon, uh, Nikkor lenses hold their value pretty well, you could still pick up some used glass or even rent some stuff for the time being. Now, with that said, the adaptability does sometimes have some limitations. I've read that some people have had some issues with VR on the lenses, the vibration reduction being as good as it is uh, just natively. So the VR might be lacking a little bit for some of you. Uh, and then I have heard some people say that they've had some autofocus issues uh, in some instances, but I mean, my experiences when I was playing with that camera just were that that didn't exist and you know the lighting conditions weren't the greatest uh, i was playing around with iso and really just trying to stretch that a little bit and the camera didn't seem to blink twice with um being adapted to the uh the existing nikon glass the f mount fx mount so with that said i think that you know yeah it's a bummer that there aren't a whole lot of lenses available yet for this camera, but it's definitely not as big of a hindrance as it could be, especially if you're an existing Nikon shooter. Now, a lot of issues that you see with first gen type of cameras is just the battery life not being the best, but the battery life is actually really fantastic on this camera. It uh, meets and exceeds what I've been used to with my Sony cameras, even with the new battery that Sony came out with a year or so ago. Um, this camera lasts a long time. I could shoot a ton of photos, pretty much shoot all day long, not continuously, but all day long on one battery and not have to worry about it. 
and shooting 4K video, yeah, the battery starts to get eaten up a little bit faster, but it really does a good job uh, considering the fact that this is a first-gen camera. This is the first time that uh, I can't say this is the first time that I think Nikon has really taken 4K video serious because they've been including video features in some of their other cameras, but this is the first time that they've really come out and said, this camera is for video shooters also. So I think that because of that, you know, the battery life has been pretty good. They definitely did their testing, and I think that helps when you're not rushing trying to be the first one to the game, and Nikon definitely was not that. So the battery life is good. I definitely think you're still going to need to have a couple of batteries batteries on hand just as backups, um, especially if you're a heavy shooter, or you're definitely shooting 4K video, you'll need to have a couple of batteries on hand, but this battery is pretty good and it lasts a pretty long time. You can charge the battery directly in the camera body using the USB-C connector on the side, and of course it comes with a charger and you can plug this directly into the charger and charge the batteries uh, outside of the camera as well. Now, number six is the autofocus. Autofocus has been kind of the main primary thing that all of these camera manufacturers have been talking about lately. You know, Sony has IAF that they came out with. It's fantastic. You can switch eyes. You can do pets and all that stuff. Canon has their dual pixel and then also IAF that they added. Nikon has a good autofocus system and added in IAF as well. Uh, the autofocus on this camera is great. I'm not going to knock it really at all. If I had to stack all the cameras up next to each other. I wouldn't say that Nikon is the leader in autofocus with their mirrorless, even though their DSLR line of cameras is some of the best in the industry. The mirrorless camera is great, but it's not perfect. Now, with that said, I primarily shoot in selective point autofocus anyways. I don't utilize the full display readout for autofocus. I don't even really like the eye autofocus on any of these cameras. So since I use selective point autofocus, I'm kind of choking down what the camera has to do in the background, the math that it has to run and all that stuff that it has to process in order to figure out what to focus on. And when I do that, the camera is fast and consistent every time and I don't have to worry about it. This is something I'm gonna talk about in my quick start uh, course that I'm gonna put out. So you'll definitely want to make sure to check out that link down in the description where you can get early access to that for free. Uh, but autofocus is, is really good. I just think that maybe they're not quite there yet with some of those uh, you know more advanced features like the eye autofocus and stuff like that. It's great and I'm glad that it's there, but it's not consistent enough for me yet to use in professional situations. Number seven is the Nikon menu. Now, some people will say the Nikon menu is just a long list of stuff and it can be kind of a pain in the butt to navigate, but I find it kind of refreshing and easy to use compared to the multi-tab and paged layout of most of the other cameras that are out there. I kind of like being able to just go through a long list that isn't all separated into pages that I get confused about because then a new version of the camera comes out and something that was on tab two, page six is now on tab two, page nine or whatever. And the layout just is continuously confusing. Nikon opts to just have sections and a long list of your settings underneath. And I found that just to be a little bit more like easy and understandable to get through. I know that if I want to make a change to my uh, photo settings, I've got a tab for that video settings. I've got a tab for that. And I don't have to go pages and all that stuff. I just have to scroll down through the list and it's easy to get there. And of course, you can even utilize the touch screen on the back to assist with that process. It's just easier to get through a Nikon menu. Sometimes you can over organize something and actually make it a bit challenging to use. I think other cameras have done that. Nikon has opted to just allow you to customize it yourself and keep it simple. Now, the next thing about this camera that you should know is that it is a single card slot. It is not a dual card slot. That doesn't necessarily bother me too much. I would prefer to have two over one, but I typically don't really mind having one card slot. Now, the bigger thing here, though, is that this is not a standard SD card like most of our other cameras, DSLR and mirrorless. This is a XQD card, which is significantly more expensive than an SD card, but there are some benefits to this. So let me tell you about those. The benefits are that the read and write speeds are extremely fast to this. 
What that means is that the amount of buffer time that your camera is going to spend in when writing, when you're shooting really fast, when you're shooting 4K video and stuff like that, it's going to write to the card much faster. And then when you take that card out and you hook it into your computer, offloading your media, whether it be 4K video or large RAW files, is going to take a fraction of the time that it's going to take when you're going over a standard connection. Now, you're going to need, of course, this XQD card and a reader for the XQD card. But when I copy over content, either I'm importing it into Lightroom or I'm just dragging and dropping it over to a folder on my MacBook Pro, it is extremely fast, the process of offloading in comparison to a standard SD card. Even though I have the higher end SD cards that have read and write speeds of close to 300 megabytes a second, the read and write speeds on a QXD card are in the mid and upper 400s, and so your read and write speed is just going to be way faster. This particular card is a Sony card. It has a write speed of 440, or a read speed and a write speed of 400 megabytes per second which is just extremely fast. And that makes the process of getting your information onto your computer much faster so you can get back to shooting. Because with the cost of these cards, you're not gonna wanna have a whole you know, container full of them like standard SD cards. You're probably only gonna end up with like maybe two or three of these cards as opposed to a bunch of SDs because the price is just still kinda high on them. So I opted with a 64 gigabyte Sony. I'll make sure to link to it down in the description below for you. All right, so the next thing is for those of you that are video shooters, Nikon has definitely talked about this and promoted it as a camera that you can shoot video on. Uh, they're definitely wanting to uh, make sure that people use this camera or know that they can use this camera to take beautiful images, but also shoot a lot of 4K video and create films with it. So the Nikon Z6 at NAB debuted a filmmaker's kit that definitely positions this camera as something for those of us that make videos uh, would want to use. That kit not only includes this setup as you see right here, but it includes an Atomos Ninja 5, it includes a Rode VideoMic Pro, and also a gimbal from Moza. And that kit right there is something that you can just throw together and go out and shoot some beautiful video really easily. And I like the fact that they're positioning the camera in that way. But there are some things that you need to think about with this camera and comparing it maybe to some other cameras if you're going to shoot video with it, and especially if you're going to shoot more like uh, for film or something like that for a short film or something where you want the best quality image out of it. There are just some considerations here. So this camera is going to shoot 8-bit internal 4K, which is great. That's high resolution. It's pretty good. But you should be able to expect a little bit more out of that considering that it has that XQD card in there. Uh, in order to get 10-bit, you're going to have to record out to an external device like the Atomos uh, digital recorder. And you get that 422 pass-through out of the camera over HDMI into the Atomos as well. And of course, it's going to require an Atomos when they unlock that raw recording straight up out of the camera, which I think is going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, from what I understand too, in order to get log footage, you have to go out over the uh, HDMI into a recorder. Um, when you're shooting internally, there is a 30 minute record limit and it does something kind of weird. I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily weird or maybe good. It actually breaks those files up into four gigabyte chunks and then it just automatically moves on to the next file when you're filming. Uh, that could be good because if something happens to one of those files, you don't lose everything. But the frustrating thing is that when you want to drag a bunch of footage in, you're going to end up with a bunch of chunks, which means you're not easily going to be able to apply effects and changes just to one individual file. It's probably going to make more sense to run an adjustment layer over the top of them, which is probably a better way to edit anyways. But I don't know. It just, to me, one file I think is a little bit cleaner and a little easier to maintain, but nonetheless, it's not that big of a deal. It's just something that I wanted to bring up. So shooting video is definitely going to be a little bit better on this camera when you're using some sort of an external recording device, but that's the case on most cameras, most mirrorless cameras anyways. Even though Sony has a few cameras now that have no recording limit, you're still getting better quality video out when you go HDMI out into a digital recorder such as the Atomos. 
Atomos. I'll make sure to link to the Atomos down below. It's what I use whenever I'm filming. It's what I'm looking into right now. All right, so the last thing that you should know, and I mean, there's really a lot more things that you should know about this camera, but they're really things that you just kind of get to know that become personalized things as you use the camera uh, yourself. But the last thing that I'm going to list is just the organization of the ports over on the side of the camera, because that's something that's pretty important to me as I'm constantly plugging things into the camera when shooting video. When you're shooting photos, you typically aren't accessing the ports too much unless you're using, you know, some sort of external flash or something like that. But the ports I really like. I like the way that they did the doors. It's kind of a big flap that just gets out of your way. Um, and you have access to your USB-C, which you can use as kind of a multi-port, but also as a charging port. You have your HDMI here, and then you also have uh, kind of a remote connection here as well. And uh, that connection can allow you to do multiple things depending on what accessories you have. Um, then you also have a audio input and an audio output for monitoring, which means I can plug in an external microphone like a Rode mic or a Deity right into the camera, and then I can run headphones right out into my ears for monitoring, which is great. Most cameras this size are gonna have that anyways, but it's definitely a feature that we absolutely need on a camera that we expect to do a multitude of things with, such as shoot photos and video. So that's gonna do it for my 10 things that you need to know about this camera. I think that one of the things that you should do really is actually rent one and give it a try. If you're watching this video and you haven't yet decided on purchasing one, you can go and use the link down below to go over to Lens Pro to go and rent one of these cameras. Uh, this camera was not provided to me from Lens Pro. It was provided to me straight from Nikon themselves. But I do highly recommend that you try out a camera before you buy, especially if you're jumping from one platform to the next. This camera is getting a lot of good press. A lot of other creators that I talk to are absolutely in love with it. So I really think that you should give it a try by renting it first. And you can use the discount code that Lens Pro gave me to offer to all of you to save a little bit of money on your rental with Lens Pro to go. So that's going to do it for this video. Thanks so much for checking it out. If you're interested in the quick start course that I'm putting together, you definitely want to use that link in the description below to sign up for early access to that. I'll make sure that you get access to that course and anything else else that I have that could be available and useful for this particular camera. Thanks so much again for watching the video. I hope if you liked it that you give it a thumbs up and that you subscribe to our channel here on Ditch Auto so you can get new videos whenever we put them out. But that's going to do it for today. We'll see you next time.